Well, welcome everybody. Um, we have been walking through Psalm 24, it's 2024. So that's the journey we're on. And um, let's just go before the Lord, um, open our time of prayer. It's May, so we're on the fifth verse of this wonderful, beautiful Song of Ascension. And let's just set our hearts before the Lord and uh, just prepare our hearts to receive this uh, wonderful, nourishing meal that he has provided for us today. I'm going to open with Isaiah 61. Um, verses 10 through 11, one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. It says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord, and my soul shall be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness, as a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its blood, and as the garden causes things that are sown in it to spring forth, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all nations. And Heavenly Father, Lord, we just praise you, Lord, that we sit under a gracious sky and that we, as your children, are the blessed benefactors of an open heaven. How great is your love towards us that you have bestowed upon us, that we should be called children of God. And that is exactly what we are, Lord, your children. How blessed we are that we can gather freely as a family, Lord, and worship you with our hearts full of love and gratitude. We just ask, Lord, that you would forgive us of any grumbling and complaining that we do, Lord, for our impatience and our stubbornness, Lord, because you've been nothing but good to us. You are faithful in all your ways. And so, Lord, we just want to bow our hearts before you right now and say thank you for blessing this day and for the gift that you have given us to just be in this place for this hour, to gather at your table and to feast from this wonderful banquet which you have prepared for us in yourself, in your word. You know exactly what we need, strengthen and equip and prepare us in this season. Your word says, for surely, O Lord, you bless the righteous. You surround them with favor as with a shield. And it is our heart's desire, Lord, that you would give us the fullness of life you have promised us. We desire nothing more than your presence, Lord. We love you. Would you take attention, full attention of our ears, Lord, our eyes, our hearts, our minds, and our mouths today and remove every distraction Cause every faculty in us to be turned to that blessed head, which is Jesus Christ. Lord, we want to be drawn nearer to your heart. May the light of your countenance shine upon us, Lord. And let your word leap off the page today, Lord, and penetrate our hearts. Open our eyes that we may see wondrous things from your law. We ask now that you would just let the words of our mouths and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord our strength, and our redeemer. For of you and through you and to you are all things. To whom be glory forever. In your wonderful and worthy name, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 So this year, as we're traveling through Psalm 24, um, the Lord is really drawing us near to himself and causing us really to um, focus our attention on our great and glorious king and his kingdom. That's that's the focus. And with everything that's going on in the world, um, it is just a sweet drawing that he's doing, drawing us into that deepening intimacy with himself. This psalm, Psalm 24, is aptly called a song of ascension. And really, uh, the journey that we're being taken on through David, the sweet psalmist, um, is to lead us to heights of greater worship, uh, that adoring worship of our great king, who is worthy of all our praise. So just a little review, since we're only meeting once a month right now, in January and February, uh, verses 1 and 2 of chapter 24, um, we set out uh, in a spirit of awe and adoration, um, because the first two verses spoke about the sovereignty and incomparability of our God, our great creator. And um, David set the foundation for us in showing us really... Um, that this world is built on this temporal flimsy foundation 
and set before us that the Lord is calling us to really fix our lives on a stronger, more stable foundation, which he has provided for us. And that is through Jesus Christ. First uh, Samuel 2, 2 says, no one is holy like the Lord, for there is none beside you, nor is there any rock like our God. And that's the foundation the Lord wants us to build our lives upon. First Corinthians 3, 11 tells us that for no other foundation can anyone lay than that which has been laid, which is Christ Jesus, our Lord. Uh, and then after seeing the greatness, the sovereignty, um, the incomparability of our great Lord and creator in verses one and two, David then sets before us this all important question that every person needs to really ask themselves. And that is, who has a right <laughs> to approach this holy God, mm -hmm. this awesome creator? I mean, who, 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 who can stand in his presence, right? Our God is a consuming fire. And we talked about how you know, most people upon the earth today are very much focused on their own personal happiness. That's what, they're, what we're most concerned about, um, rather than what our Lord is concerned about, which is our holiness. That's what he's after. So, um, you know, we really pressed in and talked about how, you know, we shouldn't be concerned about how we can become rich in this world, but we should be asking ourselves, how can we get right with God? That's the all important question of verse three. Mm -hmm. And then last month, um, David answers the question for us in verse four. Um, and he shows us that the only way we can actually have access to this holy God is if we have clean hands and a pure heart. And we were taught that obviously none of us are righteous, not one. All of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And there's only one perfect man. There's only one who has never sinned. There's only one who is righteous. And it's only by his merits that we can even approach holy God. And we know that, of course, is Jesus Christ. And it was perfect fitting uh, for that verse, uh, verse four to fall in April when we were celebrating um, the Holy Week of our Lord's Passion and his resurrection, because it really just put a, an exclamation point on that study that month. Um, you know, Jesus is the only one who has perfectly clean hands, the only one who has a pure heart, the only one who has never lifted his soul to an idol or sworn deceitfully. And so we learn that it's by his merits alone that we can enter into God's presence and enjoy fellowship with holy God. So both, we know both clean hands and a pure heart are necessary if we're going to worship God acceptably. These are the things he requires. And we don't have that in ourselves. It has to be provided for us. And it has been provided for us through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And, and that's done by grace. It's grace that fits us to commune with the divine presence. And so, you know, 2,000 years ago, God answered this vital question of man's grace in the sacrifice of his son, Jesus Christ. He says in Hebrews 10, 19, therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. So that's how we get our clean hands and our pure hearts that comes being washed in the fountain of blood, which has been provided for us. And, and you know, we, we talked about how, you know, the Lord's greatest desire for our lives is intimacy with him. And that's why we're seeing, you know, this, this song ascension as we're, as we're walking this journey and the Lord's leading us into the heights. He's leading us nearer to himself. He's want, and he's removing all the obstacles along the way. We're seeing that, right? And he's opening the way for us. And, you know, our ascent and our approach into the enjoyment of his presence, um, it's, it's meant to enrich us. I mean, this is his desire. He's a, he's, a, he's a giver. God is good. He's a good father, and he wants to bless his children. And what we're going to find is that he just blesses us with blessing upon blessing upon blessing, beginning with the most important and greatest of all blessings, which is eternal life, Right. Um, that is the fountain of all blessings from which all blessings spring forth. If you remember in John chapter four, when Jesus sat with the woman at the well and he said to her, uh, the water that I shall give you will be like a fountain springing up within you to everlasting life. Um, and so we see in this next verse in Psalm 24 that God has prepared for us a pathway 
into the abundance of his blessings. So this is Psalm 24, 5. It says, he shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Now, we've talked about over the last couple of months that Psalm 24 and Psalm 15 are parallel scriptures. So I just encourage you during our time apart to really meditate upon both of them. And both of these scriptures really are focusing on that point of time when David was bringing the Ark of the Covenant up to Mount Zion, right? He was establishing it there. That's First Chronicles, if you want to read about that. First Chronicles chapters 15 and 16. And um, when the ark was being brought up, you know, it was very important that they followed the commandments of the Lord, that God had established the Levitical priesthood as the only ones who were authorized to be able to do this service to the Lord, this holy service. First Chronicles 15, 2 says, no one may carry the ark of God, but the Levites, for the Lord has chosen them to carry the ark of God and to minister before him forever. And, you know, we find in this story that David learned this lesson the hard way because in First Chronicles chapter 13, the anger of the Lord was aroused against Uzzah. He had reached out, remember, to because the ark was being carried on cart and it was supposed to be carried by the Levites. And as a result of that, um, you know, as a off, you know, offered unauthorized, uh, an uh, unauthorized approach to God and his life was taken from him. And so we learn from stories like that in the scriptures that God's holiness is not to be trifled with, right? And so, you know, we read, you know, who can ascend? Who can stand in the presence of this holy God? Only the person with clean hands and a pure heart. So we know there's only one way that's been provided, and we can't trifle with that. God has told us. He's made it very clear, and he showed us in the scriptures what happens when you do go against what God has, you know, appointed for us. We, we're, we're meant to approach God with reverence and awe, right? Um, we see this again in the story. Um, remember Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu? Um, these were Aaron's eldest sons, and, and they offered unauthorized fire for the Lord. And the moment they did that, fire went out from the Lord and devoured them. That's in Leviticus chapter 10, the first two verses there. And, and the Lord says this, by those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy. And before all people, I must be glorified. So he's telling us that. So as we're taking this journey through Psalm 24, and when we're coming into this place, this worship of our great king, the king of glory, right? And, and, and we're going to come to this next verse and say, you know, opening up the gates of glory. You know, what does that look like? We need to understand that our approach to God, um, we need to be careful and cautious and understanding with reverence and awe. This is a holy God, but he has done everything for us to provide us a way because his heart's desire is for us to enjoy that intimate fellowship and communion with him. That, that's what our Lord desires of us. That's what he wants. So David is setting before us in Psalm 24, um, the glory of God for us and the holiness that surrounds him. And he's asking us in these verses to consider um, with humble hearts, the solemn question of who is able to worship him? How are we able to worship him? And the two examples I gave you um, of Uzzah and Nadab and Abihu, they are really to demonstrate for us how God desires absolute obedience to his commands, to the requirements that he's given to us. Um, so ble the blessing, we read this verse, you know, that we will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of our salvation. Blessing comes um, as a result of faithfulness to God's commands. Otherwise, it can be deadly, right? You don't do it the way God says it can be deadly. Hebrews 12, 29 tells us, for our God is a consuming fire. Um, so, as we're reading through Psalm 24, we're seeing this, this David's painting for us, a beautiful picture of our journey of faith. And as we're taking this journey through the Song of Ascents, um, we're taking this journey, this walk that we have with the Lord is one not as givers, but as receivers. We don't do anything. We are to be applicants of God's blessings. We are to, he's the giver. We are the receiver, and it's made possible. We're, we're that process, that pathway has been open to us and made possible to us by the perfect one who has gone before us. He's removed every obstacle out of our path, right? It's by his life, 
that he lived and the death that he died, um, and then his ascension to heaven uh, to receive the blessings for us that we now uh, have this great storehouse of riches open to us and then it's available to us. So we can sing like the psalmist saying, this is actually Ephesians, uh, blessed, this is Ephesians 1, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he made abound to us in all wisdom and prudence. That's Ephesians 1, verses 3 to 8. Again, God is the giver and we're the receiver of all of his good and gracious gifts. James 1.17 tells us that every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. And it comes down from the father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. He doesn't change. He's immutable. He doesn't lie. He fulfills all of his pro pro promises to us. And he saves us so that we can receive these abundant blessings. That's what he saves us for. Ephesians 2, four through, Ephesians 2, chapter 2 goes on to tell us in verses 4 through 9, but God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up together and made us to sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace, you have been saved through faith and that not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works that any man should boast. So God's purpose in bringing us up to this holy mountain um, and providing for us a clear pathway to dwell in the tabernacle of presence is so that we as a people would be firmly anchored in him and that we would be in a position to receive his blessing. Yeah. When we're not walking in obedience, <laughs> when, we're, when we're not near the Lord, when we're far away from him, when we're in rebellion, when we're in sin, we're not in a position to receive his blessing. And he's provided us a clear pathway to that. And it's simply, you know, by surrendering and yielding to him and following the path he has provided himself. You know, in Psalm 15, which is, again, the parallel scripture to Psalm 24, it tells us that he who does these things shall never be moved. Why would we want to walk outside the realm of blessing, the realm of protection, the realm of security, the realm of safety, which our holy God, our creator has provided for us through Jesus Christ? You know, God promises us a sure foundation um, so that nothing can move us out of the place of privilege and blessing. It is a, we have, as children of God, we, we are privileged recipients of his grace, of his riches, of his mercy, of his goodness, of his kindness, of his tenderness, of his long suffering, of his patience with us. We are blessed recipients. Um, you know, the Lord told his people, Israel, he promised them untold blessing if they would simply obey his commands. He says this, this is Deuteronomy 11. He says, see, I am setting before you a blessing and a curse. A blessing if you obey the commands of the Lord your God that I'm giving you today. And a curse if you disobey the commands of the Lord your God. Um, you can read the details of these blessings and cursings in Deuteronomy chapter um, 27 and 28. God goes into very detail, you know, great detail. And, and then he, and he says, I'm setting for you life, you know, uh, choose life so that you can live. And, um, you know, we know in, in Deuteronomy, he tells us these, these words, the words, are, the words of God, his, his Bible, the, these, these are not just idle words for you. They're your life. You have, you, we must live by them, walk by them, eat them. <laughs> you know, they're our nourishment, they're our life. Um, and, you know, for Israel and for us, God has provided for us what we can never do for ourselves. We, can, we cannot do that. We know that. 
Verse three, you know, who can approach this holy God? Verse four, only the person with clean hands and pure heart. Well, none of us can do that. We can't wash ourselves. It doesn't matter how many baths we take. You know, we can't clean ourselves from the inside out. That only happens through the precious Christless atoning blood of Jesus Christ that he died for us in order to accomplish that. Um, you know, sadly, we see in the scriptures um, a cycle of disobedience in God's people, Israel. But the God also, God also paints for us this beautiful picture of his, his mercy and his love and his graciousness and his forgiveness and his provision. Um, you know, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So even, even when we're faithless, <laughs> he's faithful because he, de he desires, it's his heart's longing to, to, to bless us with divine favor. And, and that's what our, this verse, chapter five, or verse five tells us. He shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Um, you know, in the scripture, righteousness is an attribute of God, right? It, it, it's one of his attributes, just like holiness, you know, mercy. These are, these are attributes of God. Psalm 71, 15 says, my mouth shall tell of your righteousness and your salvation all day. I will go in the strength of the Lord and I will make mention of your righteousness, yours only. Psalm 119 verse 40 tells us, revive me in your righteousness. We need this attribute that only God has, this righteousness that comes from God. But it's not only just the righteousness of God, not only an attribute of God. Righteousness is an act of God. It's an act of God. Um, it is righteousness from God. So not, not only righteousness of God, but righteousness from God. It's whereby he declares us as sinners righteous, right? Um, and we find, and, and when we read this verse in verse five, he says righteousness from the God of his salvation. We find that his righteousness is connected to deliverance. That's the purpose for it. He wants to deliver us. He wants to save us. He wants to rescue us. And it's in his mercy that he reaches down and he saves us, right? Um, this salvation comes from the loving kindness of God and that salvation that he has provided for us. It happened at the cross. It's a done deal. Salvation happened at the cross. We have to then become recipients of it. We have to trust. We have to believe. We have to confess with our mouths. Romans 3.22 says the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. So in order to become recipients of his righteousness, we must believe in Jesus Christ. Um, you know, the righteousness um, that relies entirely on Jesus' sinless life and his sacrificial death. We need to put our faith in him. Romans 4, 6, 6, 4, 6 says, the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. So it's by placing our faith in Jesus Christ that we can be declared righteous. There's no other way for that to happen. Romans 10, 9 tells us, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that Christ, God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it's with the heart that one believes unto righteousness and it's with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So we see the connection of the heart and the mouth from righteousness to salvation, right? Jesus Christ alone is righteous. No one else is. He is the only one who can restore us to a right and proper relationship with holy God. He's the only one that can do that. Second Corinthians 5, 21 says, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So we see the connection there. He is both righteousness himself, and he is the one who declares sinners righteous he is righteous he declares us righteous when you read the niv version of psalm 23 24 5 it said the word righteousness um instead of righteousness it says vindication different word but it's the same thing um what that means is saying you know in vindication from the god of our salvation right vindication which means um it's righteous treatment from a faithful God. So it's another way of looking at the word righteousness. We get righteousness. We get we get righteous treatment from a faithful God. That's what he's telling us. He's, he's treating us righteously. We don't deserve that. 
but he's doing that for us. Second Timothy 2.13 says, if we are faithless, he remains faithful because he cannot deny himself. You know, we know from Hebrews 13.5, uh, God, you know, the Lord's promise, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He promises that, you know, and in and, and Matthew 28, says, oh, you know, lo, I am with you always to the end of the age. So, you know, we should, according to Hebrews 10, 23, it says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. So we have, we have no reason to waver in God's promises. This is what he has given us. Um, you know, we did Psalm 23 last year. We walked through Psalm 23. Verse three of Psalm 23 says, he restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. So, you know, we learned, um, you know, last year as we walked, we journeyed through that entire beautiful, beautiful chapter, Psalm 23, um, that our great shepherd king, he causes us um, to follow a path that leads us to security and prosperity. That's what he wants for us. That's what he desires for us. That's what he has for us. Um, because our success, our prosperity and spiritual things um, is what brings great honor to his name. You know, it brings glory to him. First Kings chapter eight, verses 41 to 42. It says, for they will hear of your great name and your strong hand and your outstretched arm that all the peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you. I mean, Israel was chosen for that purpose. And the riches of Israel has fallen into our lap as Gentiles for a time. We're to steward these riches in order that just like he said to his people, Israel, that all the purpose people of the earth will know the great name of our God and bring glory to him. That's the reason why he saved us to bring us into fellowship with him in order that our fellowship with him, this pure and holy and intimate fellowship would be reveal his goodness and his glory to the rest of the earth that all would be saved you know everything that our gracious king does for us is right righteous right and good and he does it for our benefit and for his glory romans 8 28 we all know this verse and we know that all things work together for good to those who love god to those who are called according to his purpose we are blessed in order that we be a blessing to others and to bring glory to the Lord um, who has graciously adorned us in royal attire. And he, and he does that in order that we would be set on display for his splendor. He does that. He provides everything for us. Uh, Isaiah 61 10, the verse I read in the opening prayer, he says, He has clothed me with the garments of salvation and he has covered me with the robe of righteousness. These are our garments. This is what we wear as his children. Um, these are this is the wedding garment of his grace. He's taken off our grave clothes and he's put on our grace clothes. And we, we are That's adorned. Good. It's just beautiful. I didn't come up with that. That's <laughs> that's Warren works me. It's too good. <laughs> um, you know, we, we we have gained nothing by our own merits. We've done nothing for it. Um, everything that we have been given. In Christ Jesus has been provided for us without money and without price. It is all a free gift of His grace. Isaiah 55 1 tells us that, um, you know, we have received a righteousness that we have not earned, but we have received it. We think we trusted Christ as our Savior, we've received it from a faithful God. John 6 27 tells us, do not labor for food which perishes but for food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal upon him. Jesus Christ is the one that the Lord has given us, that the seal is upon him, and we simply need to come to him to receive everlasting life. Life is a gift from God. And the Father has authorized and authenticated his Son as the giver of life. We know from Genesis 15 that Abraham, he believed God and it was credited to him for righteousness. You can read that Genesis 15, 6, but it's also in Hebrews 11, 8. Um, you know, he, Abraham believed God. He believed in God and he was declared righteous for believing, for believing, not for any righteous living or obedience on his part. It was credited to him righteousness because he believed. He believed God. Um, it's belief in, you know, Faith, faith in the living God 
that saves a sinner from his sins. Right? We have to believe in the living God. So, you know, it's not by works, it's by faith, right? And so the only valid work, the only valid work is the work of faith, right? John 6, 28 says, this is the work of God, that you believe in him who he sent. That's the work we need to do, Amen. right? So it's the only valid work. It's faith in God. Believe in the one whom God has sent to us. Believe in the one who has come and removed all the obstacles are of our pathway. Believe in the one who has bridged that enormous gap that has separated us from the Father. Believe in the one who has brought us into intimacy with him, who has made provision for us. You know, God's righteousness is a free gift. It's not a reward for anything that we do. <laughs> it's a free, it's a free gift. Romans 10, 4 says, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Salvation is through faith alone. So no matter what we do, we cannot earn our salvation. It is God alone who saves, and his salvation is a free gift. He alone is righteous. Um, so when we, we repent and we place our trust in Jesus Christ, we receive the blessing of restoration, right? with the father and we also experience spiritual prosperity because the windows of heaven the doors of heaven the storehouses of heaven they're open to us and all the riches are ours because we we're the heirs we're his children and it's available to us simply for the asking and we have not because we ask not okay. we need to be asking we need to be praying it's so vital it's so important so the moment we place our trust in jesus christ we come under the divine protect, protection, right? We begin to dwell in safety and in security. And uh, we come under, which is such a great title of the Lord, the Lord, our righteousness. That's what he's called. Jehovah Sidkenu. That's his name. He's the Lord, our righteousness. We come under his protection. And because he's given us this free gift of his grace, and, because, and he's given us his righteousness, um, we're now enabled to live righteously. I mean, that's the purpose, right? We're supposed to be put on display for his splendor so that others will see the goodness and glory of God. And, and so he enables us by his righteousness to live righteously before him. Romans 5, 17 says, for if by the one man's offense, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. So his, his righteousness can reign in us. Holy living, um, this, this ability to live righteously, this ability to live holy before the Lord, it's actually a gift of, of the new covenant, right? The new, the new covenant promises. And it's a work of the Holy Spirit within us. He gives us a new heart. He gives us a right spirit. You know, Jesus, when he ascended to heaven, he brought, he gave us the gift of the Father, which is the Holy Spirit, who indwells within us in order that we can receive these, these gifts from the Lord. And so we, we, we're we adorned with, with beautiful jewels, with beautiful garments, um, though physically you can't see them, people can tell. People should be able to tell when, when they when they talk with us, when they converse with us, when they watch us. You know, one of the first evidences um, that we have truly believed in God, that we have experienced his righteousness, is we begin to walk righteously. I mean, it, it, immediately, it's like it's something, there's a change that happens. Our desires change. When we come into contact with the Holy God, when we become, when we're washed in the blood, when we realize that our sins are forgiven, <laughs> you know, and all of a sudden there's a, this is desire to honor God, to, to walk rightly, to, to act righteously, um, not only before God, but towards others. There, there's, there's this love that comes into our hearts. We didn't put it there. Uh, this ability that God gives us. Um, our walk and our conversation become more conformed to the will of the Lord. Uh, we find that our appetite changes, right? Amen. Our appetite for spiritual things uh, we, we're no longer satisfied with what the world has to offer, offer all its pleasures, right? Uh, you know, they're just table scraps. Our, our heart longs for substance. Like, you know, our soul can only be satisfied in Christ. So we're longing for that. Um, and you know, once, once, once you taste, you know, from that sweet fountainhead, right? Once you drink from that, the fountainhead, um, you, there's nothing that can satisfy our hunger and our thirst. 
the, or the world can't us because there's a new life in us. There's a new birth in us, right? The, 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 you know, the, the Holy Spirit has taken up residence within us. And it's like, you, you cannot feed holy God <laughs> with carnal world. You can't. You know, we talk a lot in here you know, about prayer and fasting, the need for us you know, to let go of our fleshly impulses, the need for us to subdue the flesh and, and, and there, there's so much in us that's always, you know, vying for attention, the grumbling in our stomachs, the desires, the lust of the flesh and of the eyes, right? And, and yet God has placed within us this, this Holy Spirit that needs to be fed with the only thing the Holy Spirit eats, which is the word of God, which he's provided for us, he's written for us, right? In order that we can have that nourishment, that we can have that sustenance we, that we need. Psalm 119, 103 says, sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Once you taste the sweetness of God, when, once you taste and see how good God is, uh, there, there's nothing else can satisfy. The, 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 the desire for all these other things are gone. Um, and so within the, the righteous person, uh, there becomes this new hunger and this new thirst. Matthew 5, 6 tells us, right? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Mm -hmm. It's a promise. Jesus Christ said, I came to give them life and life to the full. He wants to fill us with the fullness of himself. And we get there by hungering and thirsting for righteousness, hungering and thirsting for wanting to have a right relationship with God. Remember, that was the all important question. People are asking, how can I be happy? How can I be rich? And God's saying, no, you need to be asking, how can I get right with God? That needs to be the question, not how happy you can be, but how holy you can be, because it's only in that right relationship. It's only in that connection with holy God, where the righteousness of Christ has come upon you and within you and through you, that we experience the blessing that verse five is telling us. Blessing from God and righteousness from the God of our salvation. This is what we need. This is what we should be hungering and thirsting for. You know, we, we read in the scriptures, it talks about, you know, Jesus said this when he was speaking to the Pharisees, right? He's like, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, right? Out of the overflow, right, of the mouth. So there's really no greater test <laughs> uh, for, because this, these verses that we're walking through, they're talking about the character of the person who can approach God. And we know that the perfect man is Jesus Christ. So he's our perfect example. He's the one that has been given to us, our perfect pattern um, that we're supposed to follow. So there's no better test um, for our character than the condition of our tongue. What is coming out of our mouth? Um, have you ever been to the doctor and he says, stick out your tongue and say, ah, why do you think he's telling you to do that? He's looking at the condition of your tongue because he can tell on your tongue whether you're healthy or whether you're sick, right? He can tell that. And it's the same thing with the Christian. What's coming out of the mouth of the Christian? Is that person healthy or are they sick? Are they walking righteously before the Lord? Um, you know, is, is there something within that needs to be changed? You know, it's the conversation of righteous people. It shows and proves whether they've been sanctified by the grace of God. It's the Lord that sweetens our tongue as well as renew our hearts, right? And when that happens, we begin to speak truthfully, honestly, righteously, righteously. Um, you know, every one of our faculties come under the influence of the Holy Spirit, um, the Holy Spirit has been given to sanctify us and to purify us from within, right? So that Jesus, when he, remember he spoke to the woman of the well, he says, out of you will flow rivers of living water. This fountain will be broken open you. And that fountain needs to be pure, clean water, right? And the only way that happens is, you know, we submit, submit to the influence of the Holy Spirit in order for him to purify us and sanctify us. And what shows it? When we begin to speak, what is the utterance of our mouth? What is the overflow of our heart? What is coming out of us? Yeah. Our hands become clean. Our hearts become pure. And it's then that we receive the blessing from God and righteousness from the God of our salvation. You know, the Lord has provided us every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places mm -hmm. in order that we would be a happy and a holy people in love forever and ever. And it's his desire for us to know and experience the riches of his grace. That's what he has provided for us. So, um, you know, as we as we end this uh, verse here and go to our time of prayer, 
I really just want us to kind of bask <laughs> in the righteousness of God. So I'm just going to pray a few scriptures over us as we go into our time of prayer. And, um, you know, let, let's just um, settle our hearts before the Lord and um, pray as the spirit leads you. Uh, but let's let's pray with a spirit of gratitude for the provision that's given to us. I mean, this first case is, you know, blessing. We have received blessing upon blessing upon blessing. We've received righteousness from the God of our salvation. Um, we have been shown so much favor. We sit under an open heaven and, you know, the light of the countenance of our God shines upon us uh, and, and, and is working all things for good and for his glory. And so let's just go to the Lord in that spirit of gratitude for what he has given us. Um, and, and then just pray with a heart's, earnest heart's desire to live and walk and speak, converse, <laughs> Um, in, in a holy and righteous manner that will bring honor to the God of our salvation, glorify his name. You know, it says, you know, in, in, in Proverbs, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. And we want, you know, we're in an election here. There's all these things like, what's going to help our nation? It's righteousness. Righteousness is what's going to exalt this nation. Righteousness is what's going to bring glory to the Lord. So let's just pray. Um, with that spirit in mind and just seek the Lord and listen to his heart and give him the glory and honor that mm -hmm. is due his name. So let's just go before the Lord. Do you take whatever posture you're prayer we take? If you're online and you want to pray, feel free to unmute and join us. And um, we'll just take out these last few moments to just go before the Lord and just sit in his presence again. Yeah. Isaiah 41 10 says, fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Isaiah 51 says, listen to me, you who know righteousness, you peoples whose heart is my law. Do not fear the reproach of men, nor be afraid of their insults, for the moth will eat them up like a garment and the worm will eat them like wool. But my righteousness will be forever and my salvation from generation to generation. Isaiah 51, 6 says, lift up your eyes to the heavens and look on the earth beneath, for the heavens will vanish away like smoke and the earth will grow old like a garment and those who dwell in it will die in like manner but my salvation will be forever and my righteousness will not be abolished. So Lord, we just, we just pray this, this prayer that Paul prayed, Lord, in Ephesians 1. May the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of our understanding being enlightened, that we may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of the inheritance of the saints? And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Mm -hmm. And he put all things under his feet mm -hmm. and gave him to be head over all things to the church, mm -hmm. which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all and all. So, Lord, we are before you. Lord, let my prayer be for, become before you like incense, Lord, and the lifting of my hands like the evening sacrifice. Lord, my tongue will speak of your righteousness and your praise all the day long. Lord, you say in your word that your righteousness is your belt and faithfulness is the sash around your waist. And your invitation to us is and always but has been to abundant life for it's in you alone that we find our soul satisfaction lord in you we have no lack lord you have drawn us with cords of loving kindness you have provided us spiritual sustenance without money and without price lord the prayer of our hearts lord is that we would listen carefully to you and eat what is good, so that our soul would delight itself in abundance. Lord, help us to incline our ear 
and to come to you and to hear so that our soul may live and that we can go out with joy and be led forth with peace, Lord. Lord, your, your cry to all the earth is to turn to you and to be saved. You say, turn to me and be saved all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. In the Lord alone are righteousness and strength. So Lord, we just ask today, Lord, that you would remove the barrier of our own self-righteousness. Lord, it is a flimsy foundation that will only fail us if we rest upon us. So Lord, would slay the pride in us, Lord, and put us in our proper place. <laughs> Lord, we ask that you would make us sick of self and entirely enraptured with you. For in you alone lies all blessing. All our hope, all our happiness rests in you. May our eyes behold the king in his beauty, that we may see less of us and more of you, Lord. You heavens above, rain down righteousness. Let the cloud shower it down. Let the earth open wide. Let salvation spring up and let righteousness grow with it, Lord. You said righteousness exalts a nation, Lord, and sin is a reproach to any people, Lord. So make us a holy people, God. Make us to dwell on the heights with you. For our lives are hid in Christ and God. And we dwell in a secure place, Lord. Speak that to our hearts. Many of your children need to know that, that they are safe and secure. You're our, you're our refuge, Lord. We have a blessed security in you as your children. And we can never exhaust your provision, Lord. So help us to stop living like paupers and beggars, Lord. You have blessed us abundantly. <clears throat> Lord, let all the peoples praise you, Lord. Let all the peoples praise you so that the earth will yield its increase. God, you will bless us and all the ends of the earth will fear you. So we ask, Lord, let the nations sing for joy. It is you who judge the peoples righteously. You are the one who governs the nations of the earth. And so, Lord, we, we, we join you right now in your prayer for Israel, your chosen people, God, and ask that you would be their defense in time of trouble. Lord, you say in your word in Isaiah 62, for Zion's sake, I will not hold my peace. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until her righteousness goes forth as brightness and her salvation as a burning torch. Lord, it is in your hand to give power and might, to give strength and to make great. So, Lord, we just, we thank you right now. We praise your glorious name. Lord, we worship and we honor you, Lord. Speak to our hearts now. Lead us in our prayers. Be honored, Lord, now in our prayers and our praises, Lord. We love you, Lord. In your mighty name, I pray. Mm -hmm. And Heavenly Father, I will hope continually and will praise you more and more. My mouth shall tell of your righteousness and your salvation all the day, for I do not know their limits. I will go in the strength of the Lord God, and I will make mention of your righteousness, of yours only. And Father, we just ask for a special blessing upon mothers this week. Lord, may the light of your countenance shine upon each one, especially in this place, Lord, with your favor. Lord, you've made strength and honor their garment, and may their children rise up and call them blessed. Lord, let all her works, Lord, praise her in the gates. Lord, we thank you for your great love, Lord. Mm -hmm. We thank you for this rich meal you have provided for our nourishment mm -hmm. today. So now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Lord Jesus, our sovereign Savior, and King, we pray. Amen. Well, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen.